Hello and welcome to the BFI's Filmmaker in Focus series as part of BFI at Home. My name is Will Massa and I'm the Curator of Contemporary Fiction at the BFI National Archive. Um, I'm really delighted to be joined today by writer and critic Beatrice Luisa, who is beaming in to join us from Brooklyn, New York. Welcome Beatrice. Uh, and together we'll be considering the first three films from British director Joanna Hogg, uh, which are Unrelated, Archipelago and Exhibition, all of which are available to watch on the BFI player. Joanna Hogg's arrival was something of a bolt from the blue. Her debut feature, Unrelated, landed at the London Film Festival in 2007 and immediately marked her out as an important new voice in contemporary British cinema. Hogg worked in photography in the 1970s after leaving school and started making films after a chance meeting with Derek Jarman in a Soho cafe. She secured a place at the prestigious National Film and Television School in the 1980s where she graduated with her short film Caprice, starring Tilda Swinton. She then spent the 90s working mainly in television drama, including in some staples of the British soap opera genre, such as London Bridge, London's Burning, Casualty, and even a spin-off EastEnders special. It's not controversial to say that she wasn't particularly happy working in television in that era. It didn't really mesh with her creative instincts, and much of her ensuing feature film work has been to a certain extent, an unlearning of those restrictions and those rejections, or at least the determination to operate with a high level of creative independence has resulted in a body of work that is so distinctive and idiosyncratic that I'm going to go out on a limb and give her her own adjective, Hoggian. Beatrice is here to help me unpack this a little bit. So Beatrice, before we dive into the films and explore some of the formal and thematic aspects of them. I'd just like to throw that out there to you. What, what does Hoggian mean for you? Yeah, it's interesting because Joanna Hogg does tend to be compared to filmmakers with like an austere camera style, um, interested in questions of spirituality. Um, you know, one thinks of like Ozu, Bresson, Chantal Ackerman, those names have, tend to come up in, in, in appreciations of her work. And, you know, indeed she she's, um, prefers fixed shots and, and long takes, and she's very attuned to, to architecture and spaces. But, you know, I, I find that Joanna Hogg is, is incredibly unique. And, you know, I remember watching Souvenir for the first time, which was actually my introduction to Hogg. Um, and I was so blown away by, you know, what I found to be a very nuanced and, and honest approach to, to portraying the character's privilege. And, you know, privilege is something that to me is, the way that she treats it is, um, is very unique um, and I was very taken by her ability to to seemingly forge this new kind of cinematic language from um, you know both a kind of naturalism and also more of a sort of um, observational formalistic approach um, so you know it, it's it, it's hard to really whittle her down I think she's informed by you know, just a very eclectic mix of things. And she's such an ardent cinephile. Um, but, you know, I think that's why her work is so rewarding. Yeah, I, it's interesting you say, you, you make reference to all these other directors because she's often labeled as part of a, a new British realism, but actually, and to a certain extent, I understand that you can trace certain lineages back to the work of Mike Lee, for example. But actually, to me, she feels like she's drawing on all these greats from, from world cinema, past and present, as well as from the broader arts in general, painting, sculpture, uh, photography, for example. Of course, and, and her own experiences um, as well. I mean, like with the souvenir, I mean, that that's drawing precisely from, from an experience in her own young life as, as a young director. Yes, and uh, the souvenir we should, we should mention is uh, interesting that that's the film that you came to of hers first because it's in a way, well, not in a way, I mean, it's definitely her most uh, directly autobiographical work. It looks at the life of, a, of an emerging filmmaker in 1980s Knightsbridge and a particular romance and draws heavily on that. And there's a part two coming to that project that I think it's fair to say is one of the most eagerly awaited films um, of, the, of the coming years. We're gonna dive in and, and go back to the beginning now and have a look at 
unrelated and see if we can start to map out some of these special qualities that define her as a filmmaker. So Hogg's first film follows a character called Anna who joins some friends and their teenage children on a summer holiday in their luxurious villa in Tuscany. Anna was meant to come with her partner, Alex, but we learned that he stayed behind. She connects with him sporadically via mobile phone and we can see that they're having some relationship difficulties. Anna, over the course of the holiday, finds she'd rather spend time with the teenagers than with her grown up friends and is drawn in particular to the eldest of the four children, Oakley, who is a suave and rebellious young man, notably played by Tom Hiddleston in his cinema debut. Beatrice, do you remember when you first saw this and what you made of it? Oh yeah, I, I was completely blown away by this film. Um, I remember my, my initial impression was, you know, I had no idea that Tom Hiddleston had these kind of performances in him. <laughs> you know, but before familiarizing myself uh, with his work with, with Hogg, you know, I was pretty lukewarm on him as an actor. Um, but, you know, seeing him in Unrelated, um, and, you know, he continues his collaborations with her in Archipelago and Exhibition, which we'll discuss. But in Unrelated in particular, you know, there's something uh, so magnetic about him. He's he's posh and defiant and, and boyish. Um, and that's something that Hogg, I think, really unleashes in him. Um, you see him, you know, literally trying to find out ways to manipulate a situation and provoke his elders. And, you know, it's a brilliant encapsulation of, of you know, a sort of a kind of moneyed youth uh, that's shed a respect towards authority figures and is so eager to prove his liberation and so arrogant about it as well. And um, Anna, our protagonist, is kind of ends up as, as the victim of his uh, struggles to like prove himself and his masculinity and his freedom and his coolness. Um, and that really, you know, creates one of the most cringeworthy movies <laughs> in recent memory for me. I mean, it, it's, it's quite excruciating at times, um, just seeing Anna, who's this you know, middle-aged woman, um, hang out with this group of, of much younger kids led by Oakley, who's, um, who's, who's quite the schemer. <laughs> um, the clip that we've landed on that we're going to go to in a second is actually a slightly uncharacteristically explosive moment uh, uh, for a whole film, but I think it's a good look at some of the formal techniques that she employs, um, as well as some of those, those dynamics she creates in terms of ca characters and, and tension, tension just slowly simmering under the surface before it, before it erupts, normally not quite in the uh, visual or spatial way that, we, that, you, that you might expect for a climactic scene. So let's go to that clip now. Fucking get scraped! 
Yeah, what, what I find so so fascinating about that clip um, is how it reveals this really explosive moment of emotion, um, while also maintaining this distance from the actual, you know, event of of you know emotional um, eruption. You know, Joanna Hogg is is very resistant to to close ups. You know, she prefers to capture her characters at a distance, uh, but it's actually not alienating. It's actually quite intimate and, and reveals characters uh, through their movement in, in space, their body language, you know, the, the way that they're physically reacting and, and interacting with other characters. And in this scene, you know, we, the camera just focuses in on, on the people lounging in the poolside, sort of awkwardly listening in on this, this awful argument between Oakley and his father. And it's just, it really heightens the, the awkwardness of that situation. It's kind of like the feeling of, um, you, know, you know, going to a friend's house and like hearing them get into a loud argument with their, you know, husband or, or mother or what have you, even though you're right there, you know, party to uh, what's going on. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I find it excruciating. I mean, it, you've mentioned the word excruciating before. There is, to a certain extent, a, a, an idea of a cinema of excruciation, particularly in, in John Hogg's first two films. And as you say, all the more powerful for, for, for not letting us see this huge argument that's raging between Oakley and his father. And this is one of the moments where the dialogue is turned up to 11 in terms of volume, but it's, it's a useful way of thinking about Hogg's use of dialogue. There's so much in her films about of voices off and voices in the middle distance that are pitched at just a sort of anxious making volume where you can hear, but you can't quite hear. And you think people are talking about each other and you're not quite sure this is louder. You could really hear what's going on here, but rather than giving us the drama on a plate, she creates extra drama because we are sat poolside in this excruciating moment of unbearable tension and it feels extremely British or it does to me anyway. And the other thing that I like about it is that this idea of unlearning everything she would have had to do for that scene if she was making it in a television drama and all the demands that she would have had to do in terms of close ups and multiple shoots. And there's no way on earth she would have ever been able to film something like that in, within the conventional strictures of, of British television drama, which absolutely wants to give you the drama writ large so yeah it's it's it, it's a fantastic scene and and it's so generally her sound designs is so carefully crafted and we're always eavesdropping um let's go to the second clip in the film which is also a moment of high emotion but doing a very different job uh, it's a it's a moment when anna has left the holiday villa after falling out with the effectively falling out with with everyone and, and being left somewhat a pariah and she's checked into a hotel and V her friend who's invited her on holiday has come to check in to see how she's doing so why don't we play that now what's happened What do you mean? You're, you're, you're... <coughs> Are you pregnant? No. You were pregnant? No. I thought I was pregnant. Right. And then what happened? Uh, uh, I, I, I went to see... Uh, I went to see a doctor. I was sure I was pregnant. Yeah. I did a pregnancy test and it was negative, but I know so many people who've had negative results. I still thought I was pregnant. I was convinced I was pregnant. I went to see a doctor and he, uh, he told me I wasn't pregnant and he, and he did some tests and he told me... It was, you know, that he said that it was a symptom of menopause, that I'm, 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 I'm now menopausal and I'm not going to be able to have children anymore. I feel so stupid. Don't feel stupid. You were right. <laughs> You might be pregnant because you'll no, but I, you're young and it's obvious. I'm not young, but it's, I'm not young, am I? I mean, I, I had my opportunities and I didn't and I didn't take them. I didn't take them when I could. No, but 
Perhaps the timing wasn't right then, anyway. You know, the timing's never right, is it? I mean, you took your opportunities. You... I did, I did, I know I did, and it's... You know, and, and even, <laughs> if they, you know, even though perhaps it was the wrong, the wrong man the first time round, you still had your children, you still got your children. And, you know, no matter what happens, you will always have your children, your children love you. And I look at you, and I look at them, and you're so secure in their love. It's not as simple as that. It looks like that from the outside. Well, it is. It's not I don't, I don't need to argue with you, but it is. That's how it is. I see you, you're, you're, you're surrounded by your family. You belong somewhere. I will just be forever now on the periphery of things. Yeah, I mean, for me, this scene is, is so moving and, and not just because of, of Catherine Worth's really beautiful performance uh, here, but, you know, to me, like, the tensions and anxieties and embarrassments uh, of the entire film have kind of simmered to their boiling point. And, and we come to a clearer understanding here of why Anna is so desperate, uh, you know, to shut off one image and then embrace another. Um, and, you know, I always think back to uh, an earlier dinner conversation they're having about smoking cigarettes. Um, Anna's friend is, is telling this story um, about how when Anna was young, uh, she wouldn't touch cigarettes and she was kind of a wet blanket. And, and Anna looks on smiling, but also with a shade of disbelief that her friend could believe that she's really the same person. Um, but it's also sort of a challenge. Um, you know, she may not have done that in the past, but now she's willing to take chances. And, you know, that's something she does by hanging out with the youngs. And, um, you know, so, so that language of, of, not, not, of now being willing to take a plunge is referred to again uh, when she reveals that, you know, she's now menopausal and, and won't be having children. And so she regrets not taking the chance when she could. And so re she, throughout the film, she's sort of reenacting um, or she's taking the chances that she may have, you know, denied herself in the past, but in a different form that you know, ends up kind of being self-defeating for her at times. If, uh, if we felt that Unrelated was excruciating, I, I, I feel that Joanna Hogg turns the, the screws even further <laughs> with Archipelago. Um, she takes the awkward family holiday one step further and hones in on the themes of communication struggle and emotional claustrophobia, and specifically, upper middle class angst. Edward, in another fine performance from Tom Hiddleston, is due to travel to Africa and volunteer on a program to promote safe sex and combat the spread of AIDS. In the last week before his departure, his mother and sister have organised a family farewell on the Isles of Scilly in a house they've holidayed in before. Over the course of the holiday, Edward starts to question his life choices and his sister, in an amazing performance of Frustration and Rage by Lydia Leonard, goes in on the attack, targeting both Edward's righteous posturing, as well as his attempts to befriend the cook Rose that the family has hired for two weeks to be with them. I've always felt that Joanna Hogg is speaking quite specifically to British audiences. Um, and so I've wondered to what extent the specificities of, of her upper middle class settings translate to audiences outside the UK. You know, I found myself quite, I don't know, I was, I was like immediately pretty, pretty enraptured by the film. Um, I think that, you know, here in particular, um, you know, it, it's, it's sort of a series of, of vignettes, like Joanna Hogg never holds your hand through the plot. It's always kind of unfolding and layering onto each other. And, you know, in this case, you're seeing these very precise emotional responses ultimately coming to a head and sort of erupting in small bursts throughout. Um, but I, I was really fascinated because I found that she really achieved, you know, making a film that is, is dealing openly, you know, with questions of class, but it's not about class, um, which is, I think, something that Joanna Hogg always does so well. Um, you know, it's, you know, like all her all her features to date, um, it's about people who draw from their physical environments uh, while while striving to to better understand their lives. And you know, Archipelago's main characters, you know, are are bonded by name and, and physical proximity. But uh, we see throughout the film how just incredibly emotionally isolated they are from one another. And you know, it kind of echoes uh, the collection of islands themselves that they're staying in. Um, 
So, I mean, <laughs> Archipelago is actually my, my, my favorite of, of all of Hogg's films. Um, I think Archipelago is possibly my favorite as well. I love, I love the, the metaphor of the archipelago as, as, a, as a collection of people who really are, are separated by their inability to, to communicate or express themselves. And there's this wonderful moment where they're all walking down a pathway, I think, in the gardens that they visit, and they're just walking in single file. <laughs> they're not walking together. And actually, it's, it's, it's repeated. I think they, she does that in Unrelated as well. And in Exhibition, there's this interesting trope of people walking behind each other rather than together. <laughs> I think it happens at Exhibition when they go out for a walk at night and um, D is nervously following H round. But to go back to the issue of, of class, I think you're absolutely right. Critics and lovers of Hogg's work do seize on the fact that she sets her work in, 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 well, certainly in her first two films, amongst the upper middle classes. She's been quite clear that, that it's actually quite low down on her priority list in terms of th thematic interests. She's just setting dramas in worlds and scenarios that are familiar to her, which is why they feel so truthful. And she's, she's not ashamed to say that that's the class background that she comes from. Nevertheless, in the clip, that we've chosen class is at play as a source of dramatic tension. Uh, this is a moment where Edward, uh, who's in, in, increasingly awkward about the fact that the family has hired a cook to come and stay with them, uh, has decided to invite her to sit down and join them. So let's run that now. I just think it might be nice if we asked her to join us. I think it's worse than having to eat okay. with someone else's okay. family. Whatever. I don't think she Listen, wants to. She's fine. here. Fine, she probably fine. just would prefer to be on her own and talk to yeah. her friends. Yeah. I don't, so I don't see Edward, her. I don't have your own friends. You don't have to make friends with the cook. Fine. I don't see her talking to her friends, that's all. She's doing the washing up. Yeah, on her own. Darling, it's a job. Oh, my God. It's a job she's taken on for two weeks. Yeah, but we, do, we have to do is ask her to join us. We've got a massive table. That wouldn't be a huge thing. Well, then, go to her. We'll do it. Let's like, ask her to join ask us. Ask her if you'd like to. That's fine. She's very, very sweet. Matter. Girl. It doesn't matter. Mm. She's very sweet. Yeah. Okay. Rose. Yeah. <laughs> I think Edward's going to have a crush. Do you want a hand? Yeah. He's so ridiculous. Yeah. Burning yeah. martyr, yeah. sort of. Uh. Stop. Yeah, I've just got too much fine. empathy. Me, it's so annoying, though. It's always I'll in such a sort of accusatory up. way. Well, why don't we ask Cook to join us? Oh. So we've... <gasps> no, we shan't. That's just Edward. Thank you, darling. What's just said? Caring about people's feelings. Right. Clearing the table. No, I think we're all full. Okay. Yes. Oh, I could have done that. That's no problem. <laughs> it's actually getting quite embarrassing now. I feel sorry for her. So what do I do now? <laughs> we can both do it together. <laughs> You're right. Do you want to do, would you rather I wasn't here? Well, he's always trying to No, he's got to sort it out there too. Well, I'll, I'll <laughs> just just point, point about, about helping. Poor girl, just wants to have bloody wages. A job's a job, it's a very straightforward it. thing. Yeah. Get some pub for a drink or something. Absolutely delicious. So, you know, that scene is, is so wonderfully and, and devastatingly cringy. Um, it, it's sort of a continuation of an earlier scene for me when, when Edward first meets Rose and, you know, starts asking her polite questions and his sister and mother are like, you know, you don't have to be kind. Uh, <laughs> she's used to it and, and in fact prefers to be left alone. Um, so, you know, with this dinner scene, it's enforcing the idea that, you know, there's a comfort to be found in explicitly drawing boundaries between the classes, um, that these boundaries make things smoother and, and less guilt-ridden um, if they're upheld. Um, and so, you know, the women believe this, uh, but, you know, also in, in making a fuss about Edward's kindness, they, they warp that kindness um, into also coming from a place of guilt, which, which it very much is, but they make it explicit. Um, and, you know, that simultaneously does make him complicit in a sense. Um, like even his kindness is, is tinged with this knowing sense of his superiority over another person. And, you know, it, it really traps him 
in this situation that he, he really can't figure his way out of. Yeah, it's really awful. And, and his sister knows he's trapped. And there's just this awful little curl of her sort of slightly sneering and snarling as she knows she knows he's creating a situation for himself. And, and the mother and the sister, as he goes back to talk to Rose, say, oh, he's got to get himself out of that now. <laughs> so he's, he's sort of in this impossible double bind of rage. And the sister herself later on, we, we you know, has a, has a bit of an episode in, in a scene that's not dissimilar to Unrelated, where we have a, a terrible raging scream that happens off camera. But I, I absolutely love that scene. I love it for its, its writing, but I also love it for its framing. I think it's impeccably framed. The, the dual layer of audio happening in the foreground and the background that somehow we're able to keep track of simultaneously because the words don't really matter because the scenario is so tight that the words don't really matter. We absolutely understand the drama and the impossibility for Edward. Um, and I was look, looking around uh, uh, in researching Hogg while I was rewatching her films later and I came across an artist that she referenced called Wilhelm Hammerscheu, who I hadn't seen before, who I understand was an influence on this film in terms of its color palette and in terms of its framing. And you can really see that in this film. He, he, he paints doorways and windows that are framed within doorways. And there's that great scene where Edward goes up to the top after they've had a bit of a discussion about where he's gonna sleep and he doesn't really care. And then he goes into a room that's too small for him and the whole thing is, is perfectly awkward. I feel like doesn't get talked about as much with Archipelago is the gender dynamics, actually, because, you know, starting with Edward riding in the truck as his sister and mother cycle behind him and the fact that he's off on this great trip of self-discovery and the, the, the character, um, the, the, the painter who is the family friend, finding himself while the, the women in the film are either stuck as cook or... Um, uh, or, or a sort of abandoned wife, really, or incredibly rageful sister. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know what what you made of that, or if you, how much you interpreted from that on your reading of the film. Yeah, no, I think it's interesting because you know here in Archipelago and and in Unrelated as well, there's sort of an absence of of an older male patriarch type figure. I mean, in Unrelated, there's you know Alex and his wife is is missing. Um, and then here, obviously, you know, they're lacking a father figure, uh, or a father rather, I guess the painter is sort of a, a figure, but, um, you know, so there's sort of an, an anarchy to, you know, these, you know, these women that are sort of flailing, and then this, this younger boy, Edward, who's, who's, you know, trying to exert a kind of authority and, and making known his desire to, you know, abandon his you know, financial job and, and go do good, but that yet that's always undercut by, um, you know, the women that know better. And so there's, there's sort of a chaos to, um, I guess, any sense of authority within that family that causes them to ultimately lash out against one another. Yeah, it's brutal. <laughs> it's absolutely brutal. And location, of course, such a key factor as it was in Unrelated and Archipelago. And a crucial factor in her third film exhibition uh, where location is effectively a, a, a central character and, and in exhibition Hogg puts a childless middle-aged artist couple under the microscope really as they navigate their professional and emotional life in the run-up to the sale of their beautiful modernist London home. It's a film about creativity and security and, and moving on and in some senses out of the three of these films it's the the most subjective, it, it pushes Hogg, well, or Hogg pushes beyond naturalism into more experimental territory. Um, and there's even a fantasy sequence. Uh, as a whole, it always felt to me as a work that could sort of be unpacked and put in a gallery space, or it has the fragmentary quality to it. And it's another thing that I think is interesting for me that Hogg is actually she gets increasingly experimental with her first three films rather than getting more conventional as you might expect as someone becomes more established in the industry. So she's quite resistant actually and, and fiercely autonomous in, in her creativity. Yeah, definitely. I think it is interesting that here in, in an exhibition, you know, 
you know, her, her first two films are plotted, but they're still sort of just vignettes. But here it's that sort of that narrative um, structure is kind of tossed out the door and you're kind of just thrust into this pit of emotions and, and like weird interactions with space and architecture. Um, but it actually sums up, it actually comes together as a very, I think, compelling, you know, portrait of, you know, artistic identity and, you know, what it means to be in a relationship um, when, you know, you're also navigating that relationship in a space that's kind of uh, just bizarre, to put it bluntly. Yeah, bizarre and we never really get a sense of the of the whole of it. I feel sometimes it feels intermittently like a spaceship, you know, the way that sci-fi films are filmed, where people are moving down corridors in spaces, but you never get a sense of the entire interior. Um, it's it's simultaneously a goldfish bowl with people looking in. We are aware of the outside world, but also them looking out. It becomes a both a safety net and a prison. I think it's the most extraordinary use of space. And the clip that we settled on here was a moment after H has gone out for a walk and D played by H played by Liam Gillick and and D played by Viv Albertine. D stays in and we don't know exactly why but she's unsettled and she knows that the couple have to move out of this house soon. She's been told to enjoy it by her partner. He said enjoy it you know while you can but she's very much not enjoying it. Um, she's sort of padding around it anxiously. So let's go to that clip. Yeah, in thinking about this film, I, you know, I often think of, of this, you know, famous assertion by uh, Le Corbusier, um, you know, that a house must be, you know, a machine for living. Um, and I think that acquires like a, a really interesting dimension in, in this film. And, you know, in this scene in particular, you know, I think it's super fascinating that, you know, this is a house that the couple has lived together in for, I think, 20 years. Uh, but in this scene, when she's alone, she walks around like, you know, it's still full of mysteries and, and full of untapped potential and potential danger as well. Um, you know, I, I actually started thinking a bit about Irma Vep and, and the jest of her being this sort of phantom lady, you know, walking around like a cat and, and st instilling a sense of mystery in her surroundings by her very, you know, detective-like approach. Um, but, you know, it, it's exhibition is it's a really fascinating film for me. I mean, you know, just from the title itself, you know, the house is at once an exhibition of a relationship. Um, 
you know, the female character D is, is about to have her own artistic exhibition. Um, there's an exhibition of her house for sale. And then um, D as an artist is also kind of exhibitionist. Um, we see her holding like naked poses before a window and such. Um, so, so, I mean, there's a lot to unpack here. <laughs> yeah, it's, I feel the same way. And I feel like it's this whole uh, onion layers of, of self-referentiality and self-consciousness. It's, it's extremely in dialogue with the, the nature of the creative process, the toll that that takes on a partnership if both partners are involved in creativity, as is the case in, in real life with Joanna Hogg. Uh, there's a great scene when, when the couple debate categorization, what it means to be categorized. And I can't help but feel that Hogg is inviting us to say, or inviting us to think, you know, what kind of filmmaker am I? Where do I belong? Does it really matter? Ultimately, the film is dedicated to the architect, James Melvin, draws on so many different things. And, and that scene, for me is 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 really fascinating a because she's she's <laughs> she's dressed in a in a black and white striped top that makes her look like an archetypal burglar like a cartoon burglar in her own house but also it's like she's examining her own life she goes cupboard by cupboard which at one level like it's almost like she's checking in case there are intruders but on another level it's like she's objectively examining herself and i feel like the whole film works with that theme to a certain extent no yeah yeah i definitely agree i think you know, for her, the house is important because of the relationship she's built there. But, you know, with her other half absent, you know, she's forced to explore the house and, you know, by extension herself on her own terms, which is difficult for her. Um, you know, it, throughout the film, she comes off as, as very messy and having this intense anxiety, you know, about her own artistic practice. And, you know, the imminent selling of her house forces her to come you know, to terms with her individual practice as an artist and I mean, also as a sexual being with an identity that's her own. And so the jest of her exploring the house kind of mirrors, you know, the sort of interior exploration that she's kind of forced to do at the same time. Well, look, we are coming to a close now. Um, so there's very little left to do other than say, it's been really brilliant to talk to you, Beatrice. Uh, I know you're a big Hog fan, as am I. So it's really nice to luxuriate in the Hoggian for half an hour or so. Um, and just a reminder to everyone who's watching the Unrelated Archipelago and Exhibition are all available to watch on the BFI player. Um, I think you can find the souvenir on there too. And we will all be looking forward to the souvenir part two, without a doubt. So thank you, Beatrice, for joining us for BFI at Home. Thank you all.